What if I were to tell you a story about a man investigating a computer scandal? And then he ended up dead in a hotel room. Half think it was suicide. The other half are sure that he's murdered. What if I were to tell you that this computer software scandal led a journalist down a rabbit hole filled with government corruption, stolen elections, millions of dollars of cartel money, drugs, guns operated by the mafia uh, under the direction of the Central Intelligence Agency on an Indian reservation, which had its own sovereignty. What if I were to tell you that this all involved presidents, military coordination, local law enforcement, drug chemists, actors, computer geeks, um, and operators with no oversight or no consequences calling the shots? <laughs> this story is, is so crazy. It's 30 years old. And the people I'm going to introduce you to have spent 10 years just trying to shape the story. So you're, you might, unless you've seen their documentary, you're going to be a little lost. But believe me, it's worth it. Um, you have to watch the documentary. And everybody I know said to me for weeks, Glenn, you got to watch this doc. You're going to love this documentary. I don't know how I feel about this documentary. Because there are times over a four, four hour period, I watched it over four days. Um, there are times when you're like, oh, I know exactly what's going on. Other times you have no idea whether to believe it or not believe it. But it is a sign of our times right now. This is a story that's 30 years old, but it speaks to us. And I'm not sure what it says. Can you pick out the lies? The half truth. Is it true? It, it, all of it? Is all of it garbage? Is the appeal of conspiracy so tempting that we start putting pieces together that just don't fit? What is in us that does this? And what is in our government that might encourage it? My guests today have pulled America down a rabbit hole that is either the mother of all conspiracy theories. Or a cautionary tale about what happens when curiosity becomes an obsession. I want to say, um, I want to thank these guys for doing what they did over a number of years, risking their lives. I think, I think, the filmmakers of Netflix smash hit American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. It's Zachary Trites and Christian Hansen. But first, before we get there, I want to talk to you about preborn. Um, I, people talking back and forth about abortion and what we should do with laws and everything else. I, I, I really think we're missing the point. And people say, oh, well, conservatives, they don't care about, you know, the moms. They only care about the babies. I, I care about the moms, too. And I don't like shouting at people or anything. I think information and then help uh, changes the world and the ministry of preborn. That's what they do every single day. They first, because of people like you, they pay for a free ultrasound. So a mom coming in, not sure what she's going to do, but leaning towards abortion. If you show her the, the ultrasound of the baby, she hears the arts of uh, the heartbeat. It, it doubles the chances she's going to choose life. But what people don't talk about is about 60% of these women come in and they don't necessarily want to have an abortion. They just feel completely alone. They don't have the resources. Everybody in their life is saying, get rid of this. So they do. Well, the reason why Preborn has rescued almost 300,000 babies is because of love, compassion, the free ultrasounds. But they also tell and mean it and back it up that they're going to be for, there for the mom two years after that baby is born. Um, clothing books, counseling, whatever they need. Would you partner with Preborn? Let's change the hearts of people. One ultrasound is $28. Donate securely. Just dial pound 250. Say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 keyword baby. Or go to preborn.com slash Glenn. Christian, thanks for coming in. Uh, 
I've just spent five days of my life watching the documentary, um, fascinated by it. I don't know what the hell I just watched, though. I, I, I have... <laughs> Okay, I don't know why. I, I know it was, it was wild, but I went through so many different emotions. So many times I'm like, oh, yeah. And then, well, maybe not. Yeah. And I don't. You've spent 10 years of your life. I feel like I don't know what I did with those five days <laughs> and if it was important or not. Was this important for you? Yeah, it was. Yeah. What, I, well, I'm just, I was only laughing because I was trying to picture whether you were watching it on repeat for five days or sort no, of like. No, you know, watching the five episodes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there were times that or we. four episodes. We went, or is it four yeah. episodes? We went and just went back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. And, um, and it just got more and more bizarre. Yeah. I mean, even when we, I, I would watch cuts as new cuts came out and, you know, I'd. I found my. I, I know the story so well, but I, I would I would be rewinding the right. Wait, wait, what did that really happen? It's like, no, I told the uh, right. the editors and the director that this is what happened. But then just seeing it in the film with the music, is just mind blowing. It, it is. Uh, I, I've un I understood that you thought forty fifty one percent chance he didn't kill himself, Danny. Right <laughs> yeah, at the beginning. Sort of my default mode right. is to is to be a little bit more skeptical of this. And you were fifty one percent. This is when you started. Fifty one percent. He did. Uh, well, I mean, he, it, it yeah. was, I mean, by the time murdered. I kind of settled into my uh, into my whatever gallop pace, um, you know, there were. I went through a lot of emotions going through this um, process of of investigating this story, and sometimes I was a hundred percent certain, you know. But then, what you know, once I'd kind of like matured into it and settled into the investigation, and I joined up with Zach, who was, who was sort of a ballast for me. Yeah. Um. I. I he. He took fifty one percent suicide, <laughs> so I went ahead and settled into fifty one percent. And where are you now? Murder. I think. Um, yeah. So after a multi year process of investigating and making a film at the same time, which is. I'd say unadvisable for most people to do <laughs> to do both at the same yeah, time. Sure. Uh, and usually you want to kind of be done with the investigation. Right. <clears throat> but the uh, the process kind of took us. You know, we were we would vacillate widely between you know even hour by hour, just talking about the evidence and finding new things as we would go along, and we would kind of debate back and forth. So many times, you know, I'd be just certain that that. Danny had been murdered and sometimes I'd be absolutely certain, you know, hours later that it wasn't, that that wasn't right. the case. So I would say that essentially the official story of what happened to Danny Casolero that, that I found pretty compelling when I first read the department of justice and FBI report, it says that, that, you know, Danny was kind of misled and, mm -hmm fell into these world of con artists who were essentially just pulling his leg and then he wound up uh, broke and alone having realized that he had, he had basically been led astray at the end of this year long investigation. And their report was, is, is very detailed and, and pretty, um, you know, seemed pretty accurate to me at the time. But that overall conclusion, I think, I feel like is ultimately very misleading. Um, so that idea that like, oh, he was just dealing with con artists. It's like, ah, I, I think you see over the course of the four mm -hmm. episodes that we made that he was dealing with extremely dangerous people yeah. who the authorities investigating his death, I think, knew were dangerous people or knew that they were criminals um, it's clear that they're criminals, um, and why they didn't take those people more seriously is an open debate. And right. so, so, you know, just going from the official story, I, I do not believe the official story. Are you at the same place? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you know, that's where I ended up, but I don't know what is true. I, I will tell you the, the, um, what's his name? Um, Michael, Michael, uh, yeah, I mean, he <laughs> When he first came on camera, I'm like, that guy's the penguin. I mean, <laughs> Danny DeVito's penguin. The guy is so clearly 
you know, not right. And uh, he's an interesting guy. Yeah, definitely. yeah, he's a very interesting guy. Uh, but I never. He seemed to me to be the character that was the most misleading or playing a game. But you know, at the same time, the trajectory of his life, the things that he did experience, um, are uh, uncanny and you know and very real. You know, yeah. having the sort of um, relationship with the mysterious Doctor John Philip mm-hmm. Nichols actually being out of the Cabazon reservation with doing the whack, weapons research, doing weapons research, with the yeah. having his partner brutally murdered and tortured and having you know, whose assets were stolen uh, by a um, you know serial killer and serial ra- serial rapist with a relationship with the FBI and possibly the CIA I mean that okay that is all stuff that actually happened to this man. right and then you know so he tells a few other funky stories that we can't uh, verify but that alone is you know unlike when anybody's you, it was in, I think it was the last episode when he calls <laughs> You kind of done, yeah. And he calls up, and he's like, "People are being killed. I got to meet with you." And then yeah. the camera is rolling when you meet with him, and he says, "I'll tell you after you finish the documentary." <laughs> yeah, and that—that's what I mean. That just must have been like, "I'm going to punch the guy in the <laughs> face." Um, so frustrating. Yeah. Did he ever tell you anything after the cameras? Yeah, he, we still talk, and he still has things to say. But I don't know if it's like I don't know if he'll be able to tell me. Um, any sort of anything of such grand scale, you know, I think like he's a human. He did have a lot of ex- extraordinary experiences, but he's got his, I'm interested in his POV, what, what he actually knows, uh, you know, less what he's, he he's might not have heard. Have the, key, the, the single key that unlocks the, and, and that's the problem with this story. And I think that that scene Regardless of and Michael, if you do have the single key, you know, <laughs> you know unlock the door. Oh, yeah, but, it, but it, it's, it's you're driving America out of its mind. <laughs> <laughs> that that scene, I think, is is emblematic of of dealing with Michael, but dealing with a lot of people in this story, which is the feeling of if I just had this one more piece of information, I'll well, finally what, have. Who was the the, thing. the journalist, the female that said? You know, Clink, it's, yeah. you got to make a choice to get in or out. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Sherry says you know, that because yeah. I, I thought I thought that was brilliant. You. You either have a life of this or you just say, I I can't, because it'll always be the next thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that... Barbecues and ball games. Is this the lesson? What is the lesson of this? I mean, I I I think the, what we tried to show ultimately is a very subjective rather than like, objective mm-hmm. we know everything we do not know everything but a very subjective view I think it was really well done by the way i appreciate it and, and i like the way i know you hated it on the you know doing it at the same time oh the, but yeah. the fact that the phone rings and you you could see the look on your face and you're like oh crap <laughs> you just it is it's compelling because yeah, it was done at the see, same time i mean no it, it was exciting doing the yeah. investigation i'm just, just hard it's just nice to know exactly where you're going before you, <laughs> right. when you when you call Netflix and say we right. want to do this thing, and they're like, "Great, how's it in?" And you're like, "I have no Don't idea." Know it. And it was uh, a, it was amazing for me because uh, I I was funded. You know, we were Netflix was paying for us to make a, a film, a, a show, but I you know, and Zach was let me continue investigating it throughout the post-production process. Mm -hmm. So I basically had like a fully funded investigation that I was working on for years. And that's very rare in, you know, any, any country. Right. Yeah. But so what I was saying is just, just what we wanted to say, what we wanted to do was make a very subjective view of what it feels like to go into this world hall of mirrors. That is a, uh, portrait of 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 the sort of governmental intelligence world, the official one, and the madness, sort of pr- private intelligence world, yeah. and the criminal world, and where those three circles overlap, and the f- the 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 feeling, and and I think it's I think we show this by the fourth episode, the intentional in my mind feeling of helplessness mm-hmm. and madness that you you grasp with. When everybody is slippery, every truth is like hard is hard to pin down, 
and that's, I think, an intentional thing. And oh, yeah. I, and I think Doug Vaughn, one of the journalists that we talked to, he says it really well when he says that um, confusion leads to paralysis, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, I mean, you could say it's a really frustrating thing. I mean, I think that we maybe don't give ourselves enough credit in the show for the things that we did nail down or did expose for the first time. I mean, oh, there's, uh, there's, uh, yeah, you made huge progress. I just don't. I, you know, I, I was just so struck by the honesty that you had on, my God, I, you got to have a choice. I, maybe I have to just go back to my life and just never yeah. know. Right. And, 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 you know, I'd like you to expand a little bit on, you said, uh, uh, I don't look at things the same way. Mm -hmm. Well, watching the documentary, I, I don't look at things the same way either, but I'm, I'm not sure how I look at them yet. I mean, mm -hmm. I just experienced, you know, in four hours what you experienced over 10 years of your life. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not sure what I'm left with. What I mean, so th th this to expand on your last question about sort of what is, what's the theme. Right. And I'm not really uh, very good at pa packaging things into themes, but one, what I wanted to say was that... Um, at least three individuals who whose loved ones, um, siblings, or or parents, or in, or and also a grandparent, um, were um, taken out in uh, hits by mm -hmm. nebulous mm -hmm. intelligence agencies have uh, reached out to us. Uh, after they stumbled on the show and and watched it, and and they thanked us for having um, given them a way to talk about their family history. Sure. I mean, we didn't investigate those stories, but we are aware of those you stories. You would feel absolutely crazy. Yeah, I mean, and you're by design. Yeah. You are meant to feel crazy. And, and, it, and I've found this in just some of the things that we've investigated, where it just gets so intentionally complex mm -hmm. that it makes it almost insane to try to explain it because you're like, no, I mean, I saw your, I saw your board where you're like, you know, you're, you're tinfoil on your windows away from being <laughs> crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, the one guy that, well, let me, let me, let me go back to Danny's uh, death. I haven't seen a lot of suicide scenes. But I was it never really addressed. There were bloody handprints all over. Uh, the guy yeah. cut his wrist to the tenants. So, A, how are you cutting the other wrist? Um, but then, I mean, is the story that he got up and he was like, hey, I need a towel. I mean, I've never Basically, seen anything. Yeah, like I mean, that. we don't go into deeply into the forensics of the crime scene because we only had a certain amount of time you know in in the story and there, it was so complicated to tell the story that danny was telling but you know it, and it would have kind of been a totally Clogged different down, yeah. show mm -hmm. really and like and we're just not like forensic yeah pathologists um so but but just to explain it further you know since since we did look through the autopsy and and um we we read the report uh they sent that report to a connecticut forensics lab run run by um dr lee dr lee Henry yeah, lee, yeah yeah who's a very he's fa great famous guy he's recently come over under some criticism for potentially having um made up something else in a trial that a couple people went to jail for a long time mm. over um but that's uh, not good <laughs> yeah i mean it <laughs> hurts your credibility a bit yeah but you know he was famous for being at the oj trial he was at the, that show the staircase he's a yeah, pivotal yeah. part of that um anyway i and and we called him actually and he was, it was all right maybe this is too in the weeds but it was pretty amazing if uh if you're aware of him like calling him and i started telling him about the case and this is 30 years after he he's done Every, tens of thousands yeah, yeah, of, yeah. Of, of autopsies and, and, and crime scenes. And I started describing it and he's like, oh, in the bathtub. And there was a razor sitting on, and it was like, he could picture the entire crime scene. It was, it was, it was unbelievable. But yes, his, his analysis of it was that, that Danny had stood up at some point and like hit the wall or like brushed the right. wall. But it's, yeah, I mean, you That's look bizarre. at the, you look at the, 
I don't, I, I, to, to me, that doesn't necessarily mean that he was alone or not. I mean, I, somebody can stand up for a variety of reasons. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's hard to kind of, what did he say about hard. cutting the tendons and how did he cut the other arm? Well, we, we had, a, um, we actually sent that to another medical examiner, um, later on a non-partial like a family friend okay uh, yeah who had nothing to do with the case and and he he was like well it's a suicide and we're like oh okay like t- tell us about that and he's like well dr frost who did the autopsy didn't do you any favors and we're like what and he's like there's just not a lot of detail in this report and we're like well that is not a lot of favor like how can you be so certain that this was and so he he claimed that the you know the the depth of the cuts in the autopsy is not specific enough to, to know cut. one way or another. So, you know, the, the, but then there are also photos, there's photos, but there's also the paramedic that we talked to Don, um, who we interview in the show. And he, he talks about his, that's why we had to include his story really mm-hmm. is because he was the one who had the experience of having tr- tried to pick up the wrist. And he says, yeah, I thought, I thought he was compelling. Yeah. He's now actually, we don't mention this. He was a paramedic at the time. He's now a medical examiner himself. Mm. <laughs> so it, it mm. almost lends him more credibility ability in my mind. But, um, yeah, so it, the official documents do not give us quite enough to know the depth of the, of the cut on the, on the ligaments. So we just had to go by Don's. And then the woman who's at the end, who her mother uh, was an eyewitness oh, yeah. said mm-hmm. she saw two people. Right. Uh, and, you know, the drawing's pretty remarkable. You know, you saw the drawing, you're like, oh, I, I've i seen him in episode, right. you know, one and two. Uh-huh. Um, why was that never pursued, do you think? I, c- I couldn't say. We tried to talk to every detective still alive that was part of the... Um, uh, Martinsburg Police Department, and we tried to talk to that FBI agent who reinvestigated the case, and no one wanted to talk to us. So we would just be speculating as to the question of why. Um, no. We know that they had the information. But my logical guess as to why is because, you know, look at me. I spent 10 years yeah. trying to uh, say what happened. It was much easier, you know. I, I didn't accept the suicide conclusion. I wanted more answers, and that was a, a red, led me down this like wild path. But um, to just say suicide, it's just a lot easier. You can finish the investigation. Have a nice summer. Have Maybe nice go on summer. vacation. Yeah. <laughs> so as I'm, I'm watching this because everybody said you got to watch this. You got to watch this, and I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I was walking into. That's a good way to go in. Yeah. Do you and, remember the case? From the '90s, do you remember it at all? No, you know, I I, I was in broadcast at the time. I don't. It it doesn't ring a bell. Doesn't yeah. re- mean I don't remember it. Uh-huh. Um, but not off the top of my head, I don't. This was Bill O'Reilly still in it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He he covered it for Inside Edition. Yeah, Geraldo covered the the the, uh, yeah. the uh, Cabazon portion. Yeah. It was interesting to see. There's a lot of older legacy yeah, yeah. media. Uh, dudes. Leslie Stahl yeah. covered the Inslaw case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so this. This started out as a computer software story, which yeah. I got, I mean, it's just as banal a, as possible. Well. Yeah, but no, but I mean, it makes sense that if you are in an agency, it makes sense that's exactly what they would do and are and needed at the time and needed at the time and probably still doing stuff like that. You well, know, right. assume. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, you would be remiss. Our tax dollars wouldn't be properly spent if you weren't. Doing that kind of activity. That's what these the agencies, agencies are do. supposed that's to do. Yeah, yes, but they, not necessarily in the way they were right, doing right, it. Right, right, right. We're not but, supposed to steal intellectual property yeah. if that's what happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You believe that that is what happened? Well, I'm just being careful. You know? Yeah, okay. Uh, it seems like it. Yeah, it does. But uh, if you're watching, it. you know. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. So, um, okay, so then. That's happening during the Reagan administration, and that fits right with Iran Contra. Yeah, and then you know, also the the Indian reservation fits. You'd be making weapons used by the. All of this stuff fits. If I'm looking for a place where you know, I don't think the government actually cares about the Constitution anymore. But at the time when they 
at least pretended to, perfect place to do it is in a separate nation inside our own country. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I think that's that's something that I would love to see people, t- you know, a little more scholarship on it, or books or whatever investigations of, you know, you this idea of using sovereign land for correct. projects that are not allowed to take place in the United States because right. of whatever laws, you know. Um, so I didn't, I, that didn't even occur to me. And when you guys showed it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that is brilliant. Of course, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. John, John Nichols, the guy who uh, was the tribal leader, the tribal, uh, sorry, the uh, administrator, administrator there, um, whose backstory is, as we show in this show, pretty strange and uh, <laughs> seemingly connect, seemingly. Uh, He's in all of the right places and all the right times before anti-leftist coups happen in South America. Um, he um, he shows up at this Native American reservation and has this, you know, we explain that this, this idea of sovereignty, that they can do whatever they want on this Indian reservation um, in, in, this, in Southern California. And, and I think it's just the... I don't want to say sinister, but it's 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 kind of brilliant in its own way, and it just makes me wonder. Of course, like yeah, what else were they doing? Was this the only place? I'm not really. Oh, I can't imagine it is. I mean, it, you know, it, it there's uh, there is brilliance and evil. <laughs> you yeah. know, there's a lot of things that are happening now and in the past. You you have to look back and go. This was really quite brilliant. The yeah. way this was. The 1980 together. election. Uh, yeah, so so tell me about that because that would just kind of seem to be brushed right. over. Well, yeah. we, could, we 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 have to cover a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I know. We, we're just like kind there's of like a documentary through. on every single there, piece. Yeah, of there's a whole series. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah there basically is basically on each part. A lot of people's complain about uh, about crime documentaries is that they drag on for too long. But ours oh, is well. like we just packed so much. Oh, I know. You, 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 <laughs> yeah. You'll just be like, and that's you know the 1980 election. And you're like, wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, so there, there's really like with with the what's called the October surprise. Right. There's two. I think main stories that I'd, I'd like to put out there, which are, is that there's. Our, the one that appears in our show is, is Michael Reconosciuto's version of what happened, which is he says that the Promise software, which um, we've talked about, is, is was, a— Was uh, made to—it's t- brilliant software, made to tie all of the court cases and all of the files together. So for the ju- Justice Department. Right. So that you can sort, search them and, and find relationships. Them. Right. Yeah. And so then it was used—it was that it's supposedly taken— um, and used covertly for what purpose? For spying on our, you know, friends. the United States enemies and then friends and their their own spy agencies, mm-hmm. so that you can collect the data that whatever their spy agencies. One are of collecting. the one of the things, a smaller story that came out in the Snowden revelations was that the app, uh, the cell phone app, Angry Birds, the game, mm-hmm. had a back door in it. So basically, the idea is that you give a software somebody. In one case, it could be Angry Birds. In another case, it could be their intelligence agency's like database software, <laughs> right. and it has a back door into it. And so, whoever knows about the back door can go in and siphon out, you know, whatever information they want out of the back. So, since it was stolen for whatever reason, I'm sure Bill Hamilton would have been amenable to licensing this, whatever. Correct. But, Who's, who invented the software? But the, it had to be, I guess, sold through third parties to other countries. Um, uh, I guess that makes sense because if if he was the official official licensee to the U.S. government, then you're trying to sell it to Canada with the back door. You'd, you'd right. want to sort of not have that. You wouldn't of title. Generally, generally wouldn't go. Oh well, I'm sure the United States is clean. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. here's Saddam. Yeah, we, we think you might like this software. <laughs> Um, so going from that idea of this powerful, valuable piece of software and, and that and that the October surprise part of that from Michael's perspective is that that valuable piece of software and that valuable off the book, off label contract where you could sell it around the world um, is given to this guy, Earl Bryan, who was a friend of Ronald Reagan's, was in his cabinet and he's governor of California. 
and by the 80s, Reagan is president, and that, that this contract, this piece of software, the, the source code for it is given to him as payment. I mean, this is where it gets crazy. Payment for the work that he did getting Reagan elected. And this is Michael's allegation. Michael's the guy who says, I right. am the one who installed the back door. I programmed the thing, and I was over in and, and Iran. Abs- <laughs> and absolutely believable. The kid, I mean, when he was a kid, he was an, a brilliant scientist. A brilliant yeah. scientist. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so he's over in Iran. The, yeah, the idea that he's over in Iran with O'Brien, they're giving $40 million to the Ayatollah to hold the hostages that are that are being held in the U.S. Embassy. Um, that That's his version of the story. I just want to say... We've never know, seen any passports from Michael that shows that he's in Iran. We've never right. seen any photos with him and O'Brien. We have no, no, no evidence that right. he was there in Iran. But... There's a lot of stories and evidence about what generally the October surprise, which I would say, I would, let's call that Michael's October surprise. And then there's this sort of more mainstream October surprise that people at, uh, like Bob Perry, Robert Perry, who was a, broke the Iran, mm-hmm. big part of the Iran Contra story at AP, um, and Gary Sick. Uh, these guys who are more main, mainstream of the conspiracy of the October <laughs> surprise. You know, talking about <laughs> William Casey, if you talk about the logic right. of, of a guy named like William Casey, who mm-hmm. was who who's kind of a background boogeyman for the entire octopus mm-hmm. s- conspiracy, really, yeah. throughout Danny's investigation, the journalist mm-hmm. Danny, who Christian was looking into the murder of or, you know, strange death of. Um <laughs> He's he, he, William Casey's a guy. I, I just think he's a prism through which you can see all of this. And the October surprise is a really important part of that. Is you have a guy who's um, uh, starts out in the OSS. He's a lawyer who starts out in the OSS, uh, which is the predecessor to the mm-hmm. CIA in World War II. He then is involved with various companies, and then he. I mean, he, and he was an amazing OSS agent. He mm-hmm. um, did what was believed could not be done, which was to get agents into uh, Hitler's inner circle. Right. Um, which was like, you know, no one thought it could be done. And, right. And, An incredible know, spy. Incredible spy. And he uh, he was also, we don't even mention this, outside counsel for this company called Wackenhut, which was out, which was the joint venture at the Native American Reservation <laughs> that we've already talked about. They were, they were in partnership with... <laughs> it's like Blackwater, <laughs> except it is. It's yeah. worse. It's, it's yeah. like you know what Blackwater does. It's a much now. Bigger. Here's the stuff that you don't know they might be doing. Right? right. It was the it was the predecessor to that. The private a private security company, and they uh, they were they also were the first private prison in America. They invented that mm. that concept for an immigration det- detention center. Um, but uh, so so out, you have William Casey. And then he he becomes he was the campaign manager the campaign mm-hmm. manager of Reagan for his presidential election, and then he becomes the CIA, CIA director. director. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the day he's supposed to show up for his hearings in Iran Contra, he conveniently dies. Um, <laughs> But, Wait, but, but <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> but, <laughs> just keep throwing I'm logs just, on just, the fire. <laughs> I'm just throwing logs on the fire. But 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 I'm just saying that that. It, <clears throat> Reagan was surrounded by intelligence people. His vice president was the former head of oh, I think director of Bush's intelligence. Bush's scary as George hell. George H. W. Myself. Bush. Yeah. Uh, watch what we say here in in Texas. Um, <laughs> and you've got William Casey, who is his campaign manager. You know, it's just uh, yeah. it's not outside of the realm of William Casey's area of expertise to manipulate world events for outcomes that he wants to happen and have the capability to do that. Also, right. Bob Perry, the journalist, uh, who he wrote a book called, um, God, I can't Trick or Treason. Trick or Treason. Yeah. Um, it came out in 1993. He was able to basically prove the October surprise down to the point of um, finding Bill Casey's uh, passport. And, and, you know, he was a... Uh, international businessman and mm-hmm. super spy chief. He traveled a lot, so he had a lot of passport books. And the only one that he didn't have in his archive was, was that one. Was that one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that if he had, if he had been able to, that that passport will tell you definitively whether he, whether he whether, was in whether, Paris, whether, Madrid. Yeah. yeah. So let me go to. <laughs> We've already gone so far afield. Sorry. I know that's all right. I mean that. 
That's, that's, that's the whole show, that is, I know, but I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what this whole thing is. You could just take, you know, roads off of any of this and just go, and you don't know where reality begins and ends. It's crazy. Well, yeah. we tried to at least, I mean, we tried to do it in a way that is not as, hopefully not as crazy as what, how we're making it sound, which is we tried to do it step by step and back it up with oh, as no, much I, evidence you as, did we, a great job. as we could Thank you. and where we don't have evidence to be very clear that we're being subjective yes. or hearing somebody's perspective yes. on what you're seeing, right? But it does very quickly get into realms of, I mean, I think that some of the most damning or strange or mystifying things for me going through this experience were the things that were actually reported widely in the news. And just when you see them, how Danny saw them, which is that they're interconnected based mm -hmm. on the people who are involved. Mm -hmm. Things like Iran-Contra, BCCI, this bank that mm -hmm. was working with uh, terrorists and drug dealers and intelligence agencies. Um, the savings and loan crisis, which was allegedly tied up with CIA operations. All these banks, these assassins, rogue spies, that these things, many of those things were reported on in the 80s and up until Danny's death. But Danny was the f one of the few people kind of realizing they're all the same people involved with all these mm -hmm. things. And that's what the octopus is, right? Well, not the savings alone. There was not a Bush involved in that. Um, <laughs> let me go to the, uh, let me go to, uh, uh, what was his name? Robert Booth Nichols. Mm. You guys talked to some scary people. This guy chilled me to the bone. Yeah. yeah. He seemed like, he just seemed very confident that uh, things happen and uh, nobody's going to question me. And, uh, okay, maybe I've killed people. Maybe I, I mean, he just, yeah. he had that air about him of stone cold killer. Yeah. In a business suit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what you guys? I keep, I'm like, which door is he going to come out of? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, yeah. he may or may not still be alive. Do you believe he is? I think, uh, I think he's, I think he might still be alive. Um, There's a chance. I think yeah. he would be 80, right? Yeah, he'd be 80. So <laughs> but he's he was still spooky smoker. at 80 yeah. if he's alive. He's still spooky. Yeah, yeah, that guy, it, was he the, who is the scariest person that you encountered? <sighs> well, okay. Bob allegedly died in 2009. Yeah. So in we didn't meet him, but we have no. a lot of documents right. and things like that. We met him. Uh, we met him. I we, saw we, enough. We talked to a lot of people who did know him. And, and Sherry, went, you know, who we interviewed, has an amazing story about going to his apartment, which I think is, is you know. <laughs> Tell the story. Yeah. So Sherry Seymour uh, investigated mainly the West, the West Coast portion of of the octopus or this, mm -hmm. this story, this Danny story. Um, and she met with, she started working on it about three months after Danny died and she was calling all of his sources, much like Christian did. Um, but this is in 1991 and 1992. And Robert Booth Nichols is one of, is a guy who Danny talked to extensively on the phone and met in person and was, you know, I would say a suspect in Danny's death. Um, and, at least for us. Um, and so she went over to his apartment to ask him about these things. And he, amazingly, he agreed and he was there with his wife. And uh, at the end of that meeting, he shows her this tape, puts on this tape, which um, I think they were talking about sort of the manipulability of reality and what and perception and uh, in the media and things like that. And uh, he, he, it's the Zapruder film, the JFK assassination film. Um, and he is playing it, and then it's it's not the one that you've seen before. It's yeah, the, it's one the one where a dr the driver turns around and shoots JFK in the head. And then she's like, wait, what? I, you know, And this is 1992. When, when the Zapruder film is, you couldn't just like go on the internet and watch it immediately. You know? Right. Um, and it wasn't easy to make fake right. films. And then, and then he shows her... An, another tape and that tape he says is the the one that everybody's seen on the media and he pauses it and there's a half of a tree missing and he says mm -hmm. this is the, the one everybody's seen has actually been manipulated i showed you the real one this one is is the one that everybody's seen and it's been manipulated and i when i heard that story 
you know, I went to the internet immediately. I was like, wait, what, is there a tree mi- missing in this thing? And no, there, there's, there's no tree missing. And I think that Sherry's conclusion from that story is, is similar to the one that I take, which is that he's showing her two manipulated tapes. He's showing her one where the driver is shooting him. That's been doctored. He's showing her one where the tree has been cut off. That's been doctored. And it's in order to make it so that if she tells the story of meeting Robert with Nichols and what he told her and all the things that he said, then she tells that story and somebody's like, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And what else? And and there was a, Mm -hmm. and the driver killed him and you're crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, just to make discredit her. Um, So, I think it's a it's a very powerful portrait of Bob and who he was and his his ability to kind of manipulate people and manipulate reality and, and the world around him and uh, it just makes him endlessly fascinating. But but I think and it makes him it does a good job of making him seem just like a little crazy and a little weird. But I think he was a lot more than that. And I think that yeah, I didn't he, think he was crazy. I didn't think he was a little weird. I, I, he was the one that didn't come off to me. He didn't come off crazy. He came off, he came off like, no, we had a deal. This was what the deal was. Right. And uh, you need somebody killed. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, that's what's like, amazing. No big deal. We actually have his voice in the show, which I think is like anybody who had heard these stories would be like, oh, you're, this guy sounds like he's a JFK conspiracy theorist or something like that. But hearing him talk and, and the then de- we have the deposition, deposition footage of, w- of what happened in 2008 with him. He's, he's chilling. I mean, yeah, he's you, asked, you, you asked who the most dangerous person that we encountered, you know, not necessarily met, but encountered in this. I would have to give that prize to Philip Arthur Thompson though. Yeah, who's, really. Who's the the serial killer in San Francisco? He's got to be the person I would never want to meet. Uh, right. Yeah. He tell his story. He, so he, uh, Philip Arthur Thompson, um, he shows up in in episode three. He's the one that like hog ties Michael Orcanashuto's partner in such a way that his legs um, are are choking him. are choking him, and so he's like slowly dying. Like, the, more, the the gravity of holding up your legs, you eventually just can't do the, it anymore. The way Jesus, you know, was yeah. like, died of suffocation on the cross. Because he couldn't hold himself up. Um, if that story is true, too, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, but yeah, so um, Philip Arthur Thompson was a, a serial. Uh, well, a career criminal. And and one of the things that he liked to do was to rape and murder women. And he also uh, was a, th- a, a kind of a, a, like a major thief. Um, he would, you know, rob antique stores, jewelry stores. Um, he mainly did, in California. Mainly mm-hmm. in California, all up and down the coast of and California. And he loved robbing drug dealers he and stealing it. their guns and drugs. Yeah. And he was a prolific criminal. He was also a... Um, a protected FBI informant. What exactly he uh, was helping the FBI out with? I, I that was so valuable that he that should he be allowed to things. be unleashed onto the world. I don't know. I think a lot of jewelry store owners would be very resentful of of that. <laughs> uh, all, no, I mean also just all kinds of people who's. Yeah, I mean, I, the jewelry store. You know. Okay, I'm the federal government. He's got something big to help us on jewelry store. Okay, the the rape, rape and murder, murder yeah. and no, I mean, mean that's I, there was horrific. he usually he usually would murder the women after he raped them. But one of them, I think he he was working with a guy, Mark Masterson, or convinced him not to. And I've tracked that lady down, and I, she was 16 at the time. And uh, I tried to find her because I'm, I'm continuing my investigation of Philip Arthur Thompson. And uh, she drank herself to death, you know. And I have to assume that those two events are connected, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, at 58, she, she drank herself to but, death. But, yeah, so he was somebody who, when he would get arrested, would almost always find himself out of jail almost immediately on, on major charges, murder, you know, um, you showed the newspapers saying, you know, 
yeah. FBI. And then his rap sheet that shows that he's <laughs> just like in, out, in, out. Yeah, and it's 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 like you have somebody who's uh, he's he's going on trial for murder or something else, and then you know the lead witness dies, and it's just like, well, the lead witness was murdered before he was testifying. <laughs> like, could these events be more possibly interrelated? Um, and so yeah, he 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 stayed out committing all kinds of crimes for years until he eventually went to jail for, for life. Um, because it was just, I think the evidence was just absolutely overwhelming. Um, and it was a DNA case. And I don't, I think that when he was committing these crimes, he DNA, you know, evidence didn't exist. Right. So it was, it was hard for them to argue against that. Um, so he wasn't hedging against that possibility. Um, but he, uh, ah, the good old days. Yeah. When you could just <laughs> get away with whatever. Yeah. You get away with murder and just walk away. But it really is a scary sort of open question about what, what he was exactly doing with the, um, various federal agencies, not just the FBI. Um, and we made a little bit of headway into that. And I, I don't want to like speculate too much on, on, on what it was, but, um, it seemed to be beyond just kind of local street crimes. It seemed to be there was, there was around him. There was the idea that he was helping the federal government with um, larger political, you know, geopolitical things um, like getting like raising gun, money, gun, and gun running, and things like that. Yeah. So anyway, you got to pick your business partners wisely, and I would not choose Philip Arthur Thompson. <laughs> and we personally. we knocked on the FBI agent's door that was running Philip Thompson, and that was also terrifying. So, I mean, we, he's terrifying. Tell me Philip, about that. We can't really talk too much about that, but um, hopefully more on that, you know, in the future. <laughs> Zach was super scared that night. <laughs> I am the world's luckiest man. Not only do I have the world's best wife, who won't put up with any of my whining, um, she made me try Relief Factor when I was in pain. But I also have Relief Factor. I do. And uh, you know what I don't have anymore is the pain in my hands, that constant pain that I couldn't pick up a pencil and write. I, I couldn't paint. I'm, I'm kind of a prolific painter now. I can paint a room in one. No. Um, I began to get my life back. Now I take it every day and I have my hands back. I have that pain gone. If you've been dealing with pain in your life, you feel like you've tried everything, maybe it's just time to try Relief Factor. Give it a try. If it works for you, you get your life back. They, they're only asking you to try it for three weeks. Take the three-week quick start. It's nineteen ninety-five. It's a trial pack. It's not a drug, so it's not something like, oh, I got a headache. I got to take this. It was developed by doctors, and hundreds of thousands of people have ordered Relief Factor, and about 70% of them go on to order more. It is 100% natural. ReliefFactor.com or call 800, the number four relief. 800, the number four relief. ReliefFactor.com. How much time did you guys spend... I mean, the, the, the whole series opens up with a phone call. You're mm -hmm. going to get yourself killed. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know. When you started it, you were, you know, in your 20s. You yeah, I think so you're 26. Yeah. yeah, you're in a little invincible. How, how many times did you look at each other and go, we, we, sh we should not be doing this? What, what are we doing? A yeah. lot. There's a I fair think. amount. Yeah. I but, think, the, the, but there's also over our head was that, like, we had to finish because of Netflix, partially, and for our own. <laughs> I don't think own. that's fair. No, yeah, wait, no. Wait. They pull the plug, and you're gonna be like, "Oh, like oh, I'm walking like, away." It's worth dying. No, but we, we no, but we no, we did have to finish, like because we started it, and and yeah. and we weren't gonna like get, we weren't gonna back down, really. right? Like we had to finish. Also, um, was there? What was the closest moment where you were like, if I if I live in a country. <laughs> where yeah. you can get killed as like kind of a I'm a pretty non-threatening uh, guy investigating a case from 30 years ago like just just take me out then yeah. you know just make it quick because this is a, that would be absurd you yeah. know I we this is uh, America it's a free country we're allowed to investigate things I I think is so. that an invitation um, <laughs> <laughs> careful what you wish for um, I'm not wishing for it I'm just saying like <laughs> no I know like let's yeah, yeah. You, you know, one would hope that you could do an investigation like this without, and and that was we, our experience. We yeah. we had a lot of people tell us that that we would suffer dire consequences, and 
to whatever credit, we have not suffered those consequences. The show has come out, and what it is is what it is. I mean, that's we're well, grateful best, for that. The best place to survive is in the spotlight. So that's what, that that's how out, we looked yeah, at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is uh, what, what was there a time where you thought you were this close to walking away? What was that point, if there was? I don't think walking away, but there were some moments where, I mean, you can tell. Or at least walking away from this line. Well, there were times times when I I said to Christian, I was just like, this story or this part of the story is simply not worth dying for. You know, it's just like, no, nobody is going to, uh, you know, benefit so greatly from us uncovering this thing that it was worth our lives, and you know, especially when Phil Thompson, drugs and Phil Thompson, who we were just talking about, he, I was like, Zach, we got to do the Phil Thompson. We got to get Phil Thompson in here. You know, the serial murderer, rapist, <laughs> punk from San Francisco. Um, and how old is he now? He died. He died like two years ago while we were editing. And so then it was like, all right, so Zach, because he could have, he was a state prisoner in California, which has the most lax parole system. And he could have at any point paroled out. And if he didn't like the show, wreaked havoc upon our lives. But then he died of a heart attack in prison. And so then we were like, Zach was like, okay, fine. We're putting him in the show. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. And that was a cool thing about having a kind of, Ever evolving long project, long project, mm-hmm. you know, that morphed and yeah, evolved I mean, and changed. And 30 years old. And 30 years old. 30 years yeah. old. Yeah. yeah. Other people died. Um, there was a legendary spy from um, Israel named Rafa Itan, who is involved in different ways in this story, allegedly, with the Promise software. And we got his cell phone number from a friend of mine in Israel. And uh, we obviously wanted to do our, we wanted to get our research like underway, you know, like really Mm -hmm. know what we wanted to ask him before we called him. We felt like if he even picked up, we'd only have one shot. And then within a month of getting that cell phone number, he died. You know, he was old, you know, and people, that's kind of like. Or that's what they wanted. Well, (laughs) I mean, he had a, you know, he captured Adolf Eichmann in South America. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Rafi the Stinker, that's what he was called. So um, it didn't improve my uh, feeling of uh, trust Mm -hmm. in really anything. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it, 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 because it all seems so real and plausible. It all seems, I mean, it's a dirty when you story look at too. it at the, as an octopus and it's all connected, it does, it's, it seems overwhelming that that could be, you know, true. But as you take it like you did, one piece at a time, every piece you're like, mm, yeah, that, that, that works. Yeah, that's that how works. we wanted it to feel was you were sort of like paddling out. And you, you kind of go to this buoy, and you're like, I can still see land. Like, I'm fine out here. Mm-hmm. And then you then we go to the next buoy, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a little further away. And then a few of those later, you're like, Where I'm in I? the middle of the ocean, and yeah. I have no bearings anymore, which I think is what we wanted to capture of how we felt like Danny, who spent a year doing this, and Christian spent 12 years doing this, and me spending several years doing this. That's the general feeling that you get when you go through this, and you're just like, what? Is real anymore? Did your families have? I mean, twelve years. Your family or any of your friends or anybody just go, dude, you are, you're gone. In like the first, like two, 2015 was my worst uh, year of of this, like emotionally, uh, physically, and mentally. And uh, is explain that, that. Explain that to me. I mean, I was just like I'd, I'd like withdrawn. I, I'd. I'd had a relationship with a um, uh, a business relationship with a literary agent, and my background is as a photojournalist. And I, my first book was going to be this in, insanely complicated nonfiction um, investigation about this at that point twenty six year old case, 
and uh, I was way in over my head, <laughs> but I was I wanted to 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 complete this. I wanted to mm-hmm. get it out, and I was like just like really like, and I was just alone and uh, just struggling, not sleeping a lot, like trying to like. If I just stay up a little longer, I'll, I'll figure it out. And, you know, I was like kind of miserable, I, I think, and, lo- and lonely. And, and I, you know, was broke and my other career as a photojournalist was suffering. I wasn't taking good care of myself. I mean, you, I mean, I, I kind of block a lot of that stuff out, but you were there. You, and I, yeah, we, I, you know, go over to Christian's house and he's like, <laughs> been sitting in the same position for two days straight, you know, like, it's like, did you sleep? And it's like, what? Uh, like a couple of days ago, you know, that kind of thing. And it was just, it was just bleak. And, and his sisters and I and our friends all talked about it. It was just like, you know, is it time to intervene? And like, how do we get Christian there's back? Also like, there's, you know, the stages of grief. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also like the stages of conspiracy. And I think one <laughs> of the stages where you go to a dinner party or a barbecue and you try, you pick, you know, anybody from the crowd and you try to convince them of this thing that you've been studying, you know, because if you can convince someone at the dinner party and they believe you, then it will help you believe you because mm-hmm. you're like struggling with this like mm-hmm. complex, untangible. It doesn't really work out well, does it? <laughs> that, no, it doesn't. Yeah, and I think, Especially for the guests at the dinner party. Yeah. You know, I'd be like, all right, I'm just going to go to this barbecue and I'm not going to talk about the case, okay? I'm just going to go. I'm just going to be normal. And then, like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I, so that, that would, like, it was a process that, you know, kept repeating. And I referred to it earlier in the show. Like, I've sort of matured into this. And I can talk about other things, too, now, you know, uh, I think. Can you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's all con- but it is all consuming, and it, it changes your worldview enough to yeah. where you... Even our editors that worked on it, sorry to keep interrupting you, Glenn, but, like, our, our, all the editors that we worked with, you know, they're just, like, they're guys that they cut, they cut movies and shows. Right. And they, they all became, like you know, very suspicious and they changed their worldview yeah. of, of like geopolitics and, and you can't unsee things, right. yeah. you know? Yeah. And so when, and you know, when it's, you know, there's a, there's so many conspiracy theories out there that are just so much bull crap, but there are a few, the, the really well designed ones I, I think are you, they, they have certain hallmarks and it is, the same like 25 people, you know, or 10 people that are just like, wait, 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 this connects here because of that one person. And once you start seeing that matrix, it, it, uh, it's hard because you feel either alone uh, uh, or you're, you feel like you're seeing something that nobody else is seeing and it's right there. Yeah. Do, yeah. Does that make sense to yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. And that's usually when your friends go, maybe you should stop talking about this. Maybe you should stop. Maybe do, do, did your friend, did you, before you were like, let's roll up our sleeves and go, <laughs> did you, was there talk about, let's get him off this? Yeah. Side yeah. I mean, else? we did. And, and, and it was a years long process. I mean, I didn't start making this. Christian started talking about this back in 2000. 12 or whenever we've he started. We've been friends since before. We were friends for, for, you know, we grew up together. Um, and so it was mainly a process for me of like, oh, that's an interesting story. And then just wor- <laughs> worried about Christian right. for like his own mental health. And then when he's tell, t- telling me more about the people that he was t- reaching out to, and it was, then it was like worry for his physical safety. It's like Correct. these people don't seem like they might have your best interest at heart. Um, that you're talking to. And then, and then the problem is that you kind of hear enough about this story to where it begins to grabs onto you. There's, it puts its little hooks in you and then you're like, well, that is kind of weird what happened with like, and it's got to, you got to, I think you even said this, it's got to feel like. If I just get this, yeah. we just it's get a, this. The carrot is, yeah. is yeah. in front of you. And it just opens up another door of craziness. Yeah. I, think, I think that what we tried to do, though, was try to put some blinders on and that we didn't make a movie that's about conspiracy theories or about the, you know, the, the social history of conspiracy theories or anything that's really past 1990. 
two or three, you know, Danny died in 1991. We didn't graft this story onto the present. And there's conspiracy, conspiracy, theory, conspiracy theories have become this boogeyman that, that is in the popular culture incessantly now. And, and I'm Why interested is in that. that? I, I, I don't it, it, I don't know for sure, but 1991, the year that Danny died, is such a such a significant year for conspiracy theories. It's, it's the year that the movie JFK by Oliver mm-hmm. Stone came out. It's the year that. Do you know who David Icke is? He's like a British conspiracy theorist. He talks about yeah. lizard people. He was oh, a, yeah, he yeah, was a okay. BBC uh, sports announcer mm-hmm. who goes on the Wogan show in 1991 and says that he's the re- reincarnation of Jesus. Danny Casolaro dies. Um, I mean, the, I, the, behold a pale horse. This book, behold a pale horse, major conspiracy came book. out. It was uh, just like I think they called that summer, 1991, the summer of conspiracies, because it was right at the end of Iran Contra, and there was, was an October surprise investigation going on. Mm-hmm. The Inslaw yeah. case was all going these on. conspiracies were bubbling up in Washington. But but you know, I, I don't exactly know why conspiracy theories, uh, you know, are such a topic to du jour now i do know the feeling of what they do to your brain and we don't really talk about this in the show very much but my theory is that in, in the absence of knowledge of information the human brain makes up the worst possible fills in the gaps with the worst possible possibilities right and so you're or pre-programmed or to I, see I've, the negative i've I've lost, I'm losing my hearing mm-hmm. badly. And um, what happens is your brain fills in what mm. you can't hear. And it just, it just takes bits and pieces. And it like, I've heard my wife say in just crazy things, you know what I mean? And I, I go, what did you just say? How do, <laughs> like, yeah. What? It like makes no sense that she would say something. And it's just the brain filling in what it thought it right. heard by grabbing just a little bit. Of, and I think it, that's, I think conspiracy that's theories what, or, or the idea of like the government is doing this or, or, you know, these people are doing this or whatever group you don't right. like is doing this. It's a, it's a, I think it's a very natural mental process. I think it's based on psychological concepts like negativity bias and things like that. We won't go into it. But what I'm trying to really get back to is for us, we really tried to put blinders on and just focus on this story. And it's a very complicated story, but just saying like, what can we actually, what is a conspiracy theory and what's an actual conspiracy, which it has a legal definition and right. it's where, you know, multiple pe- people get together and do a crime. There's a difference between a conspiracy theory and a conspiracy fact. Right. <laughs> you know, there That's what are we're conspiracies. And, and, right. and. But it's, it's gotten so muddled. Some people refer to some people call it conspiracy theories. They just say conspiracy. I don't believe in conspiracies. Or like in our show when we called the FBI agent Scott Erskine, he says, "Oh, you know Danny Casolaro. Ha ha ha. He was uh, well. You know he was talking to uh, a lot of people who were uh, who believed in conspiracies and and were involved in conspiracies. <laughs> and we're like." Okay. Like, <laughs> but he means to say conspiracy theorists. Yeah, 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 but he, he, yeah. Well, give him the benefit of the doubt. No, I, no, I'm just right, saying, right, I just right. think it's, it, that is an example of how people, it's you know, slippery. it's become so, so slippery, muddled. Yeah. 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 So, because I, I drew some things to today that maybe you didn't intend at all, and, and that would be, I guess, a good thing. Or is it what you want me to do? <laughs> um, but uh, it, I, I drew... You know, in in the in the in times where things where you just don't have good answers, like you know, the Titanic, it, we're we're going way too fast. Uh, what the hell are we doing? Going you know in around the icebergs at this speed? Well, they didn't want to tell you that there was an out of control fire. You know, in the burners, it wasn't it wasn't going to burn everything to the ground. They just could not control it. So just open it up and let it run. Um, when you don't have the facts, you look at things and go, well, I'm not getting the truth. And so you're more open. And the way to stop all this stuff is to just have some transparency. But I don't even know what's transparent anymore because the Internet has made things you can find whatever, and now with deep fakes, it's going to get 
much work. Because yeah. you'll be able to make that Zapruder film. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No. It's, um, it's, uh, and so <laughs> in, in the, uh, in, there's an Unsolved Mysteries episode about the Danny Castellaro case that came out in 1993. And at the end of it, they talk about this event that occurred at, at Danny's funeral where a man in a, a military uniform puts a medal on Danny's casket. And th- then, you know, Anne Clink, who's in our show, and, and, you know, different friends and family of, of Danny were like, who was that guy? And, and why did he do that? And what does it mean? And, and the way that the unsolved mysteries episode is, you know, it's a, the recreation, the guy looks like Colin Powell kind of, and like, he's, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and th- with the music and the editing, you're like, well, what was Danny like actually like a spy? Like, why would he do that? Like, what was he doing? Um, and then, um, so, it was very significant to me that Danny wrote about computers at a time when not many people did. And then that led him to the story about computers mm-hmm. that led him to all of the re- the rest of it. Um, you know, the, the promise software story. So when I was working on research for the book in the early days, I was calling people that he worked with at this computer industry trade publication called computer age. And, and there were a few names on the masthead of the publications that I was able, able to track down and they introduced me to um, other people that worked there, and they introduced me to other people that worked there. And I met, I called this guy that worked in the in the print shop. All I knew was uh, was his name. I called him and and I said, "Hi, my name's Christian. I'm writing a book about Danny Castellero." And he was like, "I've been waiting, you know, 25 years for for this call." And I was like, "Wow, okay." And he was like, "Have you ever seen the Unsolved Mysteries show about this case?" And I was like, "Yeah, I I have." Uh, he was like. I'm the guy. And I was like, uh, <laughs> what? what guy, which guy, you know, you, he's like, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. I'm like, what guy? And he's like, I'm the guy that put the medal on, on Danny's casket. And I was like, you wait, you were. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, well, first of all, tell me the story and then tell me why you didn't come forward. You know, that there's this big question about who this person is. And he said, well, you know, me and Danny, we, we, we were friends at work. We were work friends. And, and after work, we, we'd sometimes have a beer in the parking lot of the office building where their, where their publication was based. And, and Danny used to say that he'd wished that he'd gone to war because he wished he'd gotten a medal. Mm. And this guy was like a highly decorated uh, uh, soldier from Vietnam. He was in deep, heavy, horrible combat. And, um, you know, he's like, Danny, you know, you're, you're good. You don't want the medal. And, and Danny's like, no, I wish I had the medal. And this guy, you know, had, had been mm-hmm. through hell and he had a bunch of medals to show for it. And so he thought about that conversation the day that he was going to the funeral and he decided to put on his military uniform, like his formal attire and put the medal on, give Danny his best medal. Wow. And, um, and that was just something he did for himself. He just, and it was something, a private moment between him and his late friend that, he, you know, so then I was like, well, why did you wait? Like, why are you not, you know, why, why did you let this mystery surround it? And he said, look, man, if they can't figure out who I was, they're not going to figure out what happened to Danny. So, you know, you found me and I want you to figure out what happened to Danny. Something like that. <laughs> um, but so like you're saying with the conspiracy theories, you, you, you know, your mind goes everywhere. Who's the guy that put the metal on the casket? Who yeah, was that? Know. You know, and it's just we a have, guy, you know, we have uh, in, in my job, I've had people come up to me and say, I know what you were saying about such and such. You're like, what the hell was I saying? Well, I know what you said, but I heard you. And you're uh-huh. like, no, I didn't. No. You know, there are people out there that do want to go into this space. I don't know why, but they do want to go into that space. And, and, and they, connect everything and to everything. And connect everything to everything. You know, some things are connected. Yeah. Some things are not. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Right. I think that that was our... <laughs> main issue right and we knew we we prune the trees we knew in the office that people on the internet would say that the show is a limited hangout which is a term uh, that means that you know an intelligence agency admits to part of a larger thing in order to like distract distract and you know 
op- obfuscate the larger crime. A sacrificial the, lamb for the larger. Mm-hmm. And then, sure enough, you know, <laughs> you, yeah, it, it's on the internet that this show is supposedly a limited hangout. But no, we did the best we could. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're not CIA spies, or we, no. honestly, yeah. like it would make our lives so much easier. <laughs> No, I know. If, if the recruiters are out there, yeah. and it, it would make a phone call away. probably be a lot happier too. Me? No, I mean if you were a, if you were a spy and you had the answer, I you, mean, you, oh, you would assume you'd get more access. Yeah, you'd have you'd access. Get the access. Right. I wouldn't want to do any like wet work though. I'm <laughs> squeamish about blood. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The wet work part would and probably morality. Be. I've got morality. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I have morality. <laughs> so, so, so final thing final said. thought. What what do you walk away with, or hope that the audience walks away? Because I'm not sure. And those are usually the best things. You go to a movie, or you'll read something, and you're like, I don't. No, I know that affected me. I know that may have changed me, but I'm not sure how yet. Mm -hmm. I think, and that's very rare that that happens, and I think you captured that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we can't inherently solve every mystery that's brought up by the octopus, right? But I almost, and and I, I, but we also, I don't think are leaving it with like a, oh, like, just wait for season two or like this is a completely ambiguous ending and nobody knows anything. It's like, I think that we bring people on a journey and show for the first time often new information and new facts and, and, and draw conclusions about the relationships between all these people and these string of murders and crimes. Um, But I do think that there is, if you could say it's ambiguous, it's like, I look at it like we're making almost like a nature documentary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like we're studying an ecosystem and there's no real beginning and end to an mm-hmm. ecosystem. You, you know, you make a nature show and you see the hunt and you see the aftermath and you see the relationships between all the different animals and character, you know, you treat them as characters. That's a little bit what we're doing with the, some of these conspiracies or, or, or political scandals or, or intelligence operations. Like we're, we're showing our view, our experience of how they relate and they work um, as, 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 you know, people who have, done the research or whatever, mm-hmm. done a lot of research. Um, and so I think taking away from that feeling that you can get tangible answers, but you have to be comfortable in a certain level of ambiguity. You have to be comfortable floating just a little bit and never <laughs> coming to grips with the feeling of, okay, I can, I can walk away because I know at least this much information or I can keep on living my life because I mean, for the more moral for me was you could do this forever, but it's nice to have like other things going on in your life. Like friendship, I think was oh, yeah. a big part of it and being able to walk away and not have to know every answer to every single thing. Correct. And that's, that's actually important on a personal level. You know, if that makes that sense. That was a huge, it was a really blessing. I, I thought a uh, message in there. Yeah, I think it's you know. tragic that, that, you know, Danny was doing this in 1990 and 1981 alone, largely. And I think that is sad to think about somebody, you know, kind of traveling through this world on their own. And, he and had that, to bounce his ideas off of Robert Booth Nichols. I had Zach. <laughs> <laughs> you had a better partner. Yeah. You, you, final thought from you. Um, I, I intend to keep investigating. Um, this? Uh, this well, this constellation, this yeah, ecosystem, okay. and uh, you know, I'd love to eventually make my way into you know the modern era. I don't know, like I, because yeah. I only know if when I've like investigated something, what I think about it. Um, so no, I don't know. Uh, it's been amazing to have uh, to have Zach help me out with this. I mean, I would have been, I was pretty lost until. You know, he joined. He joined me. I don't know. <laughs> it's great. It's it's too big of a thing to come up with like any sort of little final thought. I think. No, but I like the idea that um, it's more satisfying to think of this as a study on the ecosystem mm-hmm. because something like this, you know, just doesn't appear and then go away for whatever. I mean, especially when nobody gets in trouble. Yeah, and yeah. people are cl- clearly like making money. I mean, it's yeah. worthwhile to people yeah. to be involved in that.
Guys, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having me.